So what are we doing here this evening? We are here to remember, if you will, the 77th anniversary or the 77th year after the beginning of the, uh, the process that led to the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And it's an important moment in Jewish history because there was a seismic change in Jewish consciousness that, that had perhaps been beginning for quite a while, but, but came to fruition in a very large way at the time of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And I'd like to sp uh, uh, speak about that a little bit and, 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 and learn about it with you and see if we can identify some of the qualities that existed at that time that contributed to that gigantic change in attitude amongst the Jewish people. And I think this fits into a general concept that Jewish memory is not just about remembering to know. Jewish memory includes in it instruction for future. It includes in it knowledge and wisdom that we hope will, will allow us to maneuver our lives and the lives of our family, our children, our communities in a way that is much more secure, if you will. In other words, we, we, we remember what we've gone through as a people in the hopes that it will help us get through what we're, what we're going to go through. And that's what I hope to do today, to be able to see if we can identify some of the qualities that exist or existed that might, that, that will show how they adapted to their new normal, if you will. So let's put, let's do context. Before World War II, Warsaw was the center of the Jewish population of Europe. Jews had lived there for over 500 years. By the eve of the war, fully 30% of the city was Jewish. In 1939, the Germans conquered Poland very quickly, and World War II began. The Germans had planned to deport the Jews. However, the plans didn't immediately succeed. And so, as an interim measure, Jews were concentrated in cities and near railways, and these became ghettos. The ghettos were not an end in and of themselves. They were interim measures, again, on the way to deportation and then later on to mass murder. Once the ghetto became reality, the Jews trapped inside were its prisoners. They could no longer come and go freely as they wanted to. They literally went to bed one night and woke up the next morning surrounded by walls. And now at the entrance to the ghetto stood very intimidating symbols of authority, German guards and Polish policemen. Any Jew who was found outside the ghetto was unceremoniously shot. The Jews were sealed inside the ghetto. So what do we see? We, first of all, we, we, we see that Warsaw at one point was uh, one of the most dynamic and, and powerful Jewish communities in, in the world. It not only was the home of uh, great Hasidic courts, but it was the home of the, the Renaissance of Jewish thought, right? Uh, Polish, Poland was, comparative to other places, uh, a, a bit liberal, not terribly liberal. There was quite a bit of anti Semitism, but nevertheless, it did allow a certain amount of Jews to attend university, and it did allow for a certain amount of integration into the overall Polish society, which uh, was a breeding ground for thought and development amongst the Jewish people. There were Jewish representatives, members of, of, the, of, the, of the Polish parliament. It was an advanced place. And as once the war broke out in September of 1939, for the Jews to be gathered into Poland was not an entirely foreign concept, right? They moved Jews into a place where there was, if you will, certainly nothing adequate, but some kind of Jewish structure in which the Jews could function in some type of familiarity. 
What exactly? In April of 1942, the population of the Warsaw Ghetto had hit approximately 400,000 people. That's April of 1942. This is already a point where it was a full-blown ghetto. And the Jews, that means they could go out if they had a pass to work, but they were more or less confined. But it's important to remember, as you see the following snippet, which was taken in May of 1942. So you'll really see what it was like. It was a society. It wasn't a prison in the sense that the Jews were prisoners and they woke up at the same time and they ate at the same time and they, they were not allowed to leave their room. It was a society. There were wealthier people and there were poor people. Of course, the poor people were poorer than poor. And the wealthy people were, were unable to make a living and were, were going through whatever they had in an, in an abnormally quick way. There, was, there were opportunities, there were restaurants, but most, 90% of the people couldn't afford to eat there. There was a park where you had to pay if you had the money, which most people didn't. There were social services, but it was insanely crowded and it was riddled with all the, the social diseases that any society could have, the greatest of which was in unbelievable poverty. This is in May of 1942. <laughs> ghetto was a community. It was a place. You see, people had things. They, they were forced out of one area of the ghetto, so they took their things and they went to another. They created for themselves, as terrible as it was, a life. As difficult as it was, it was a life. And that life was characteristic of what I think is a uniquely Jewish quality in that there was an attempt to contextualize their experience and to derive knowledge from past experiences, which would give them the wisdom to survive their present existence. And so what did they say? They said, this is a terrible time the Jews are going through. This is terrible anti-Semitism, terrible persecution, but it's not the first time. It's not the first time we've gone through this. But perhaps this was the, a unique period of anti-Semitism persecution in that it was so crowded, in that there was so many affectations that were taken away. There were cars, there were pictures, there were radios. And even though the Jews were deprived the right to use all of those things, although there was telephones in the ghetto, there, were, there was a post office that functioned in the ghetto. It, nevertheless, 
it was a terrible time. And they tried to understand how to understand their circumstance. In April of 1942, the ghetto was in a high state of agitation, partly because of the crowded conditions, partly because of the fact that people talked and rumors spread. But one rumor in particular was regarding the liquidation of the Lublin ghetto and the circulation of a report called the, the Grozhanowski report. Now this report was an eyewitness account about the atrocities and the German Chelmno extermination camp. There were six death camps, and Chelmno was the first of them. It was created solely for the purpose of killing people. And it was where the Germans experimented to a large extent with methodology they could use to destroy lives quickly. And it was, it was infamous for its use of gas vans. And this fellow, right, Zalma Barwiner, who had the uh, pseudonym Yaakov Grozhanowski, he managed to escape after spending a week as part of the Sonderkommando, the Jews that were forced to work in service of the Germans um, in the most horrendous uh, uh, jobs in a place like hell, no dealing with the bodies, uh, um, disposing of the dead bodies, um, despoiling of the bodies, etc. He escaped, he made his way to, to uh, Warsaw, and he gave his report to the Oenig Shabbos, right, which was headed by Emanuel Ringelblum. That's another class. But word of his arrival in the ghetto began to spread because of the crowded conditions, because people were looking for some way to understand the reason for the, the persecution, the goal of the persecution, to try to predict an end to the persecution will it lighten up. What's the, they didn't know, they didn't, what they didn't know in many respects is much more important than what they did know. And this report, from Zalma Barwiner created a great deal of anxiety, plus the liquidation of Lublin. There was a sense of something happening that was terrible, and they didn't know it, and it only added to their anxiety of how are they going to eat, how are they going to take care of their families, how are they going to survive from day to day, and on top of that, there was a tremendous sense of foreboding and uncertainty. What was the reaction to this? Well, they turned to their leadership, one of whom was Dr. Ignacy Shipper. He was a professor at the University of Warsaw. He was a historian, a Zionist activist. He was considered a, a leader, a Zionist leader uh, of, of the Warsaw community, someone who was well-connected, someone who understood politics. And what did he write? He wrote, it's impossible to liquidate a population of half a million souls, because he heard already of the liquidation of Lublin. They heard about a place called Treblinka. They heard about everything that was going on in Chelmno. The Germans will not dare to annihilate the largest Jewish community in Europe. They will have to reckon with world public opinion. And finally, there is the assurance of Governor General Frank that Warsaw, Radom, and Krakow will remain. What were the basis of, of their what knowledge did they use to interpret all that was going on around them and all that they heard, the rumors? They based it basically on three things. The first is simply the size of, of the Warsaw Jewish community. It was a major community, 400,000 people. That's, a, that's, a, that's a, a tremendous amount of people. Secondly, they understood that we live in a world, and they lived in a world, where it, it, there was mass communication, where people knew what was going on, even if they didn't know exactly what was going on, they certainly would know of the extermination of 400,000 people, and they trusted that world. They trusted the leadership of the world. The great men like Roosevelt and Churchill would never let an atrocity like what they imagined could happen to, to happen. And lastly, ironically, they had a certain amount of trust in the leadership of the government in which they found themselves, which in 1942 was the, the Nazis. And they, they remembered the Nazis from World War I. 
They, they, they understood now the Nazis were the enemies of the Jewish people and the Nazis were persecuting the Jewish people, but they, 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 they couldn't imagine, it seems, based on the statement of Dr. Schipper, it, they couldn't imagine a people completely devoid of any shred of integrity. Yet the rumors persisted and the anxiety increased until one point on July 20th, 1942, Adam Chernyenko, who was the head of the Judenrat in the Warsaw Ghetto, a controversial figure, not as controversial as other heads of, of Judenrats, but a, a, a nevertheless a controversial figure, he needed to, he wanted to deal with these rumors. He needed to lower the anxiety in the ghetto. So he went on July 20th. He writes in his diary. In the morning at 7.30 at the Gestapo, I asked Mende, Gerhard Mende, right? You'll see a, a picture of him on the side, SS Sergeant Gerhard Mende, how much truth there was to the rumors about deportation. He replied he had heard nothing. So he wanted confirmation, Cherniakov. I turned to SS Obensturm Führer Karl Brandt. He said he also knew nothing. I went to the deputy chief of Section 3 Sheriff. He expressed his surprise at hearing the rumors and informed me that he too knew nothing about it. Finally, I asked whether I could inform the population that their fears were groundless. He said I could, that all the talk was utter nonsense. I ordered Jacob Lakin, commander of the Jewish police, to make the public announcement. Now, Chernyakov wrote that on July 20th, 1942. He heard the rumors. He, they're, they're, the intelligentsia of the Jewish people felt that it, the rumors were impossible to be true. And he therefore, then he went to the people responsible, in essence, for keeping the ghetto alive and they too said there wasn't a deportation. Now, when he said he wanted to know the truth about deportation, he was not asking, is it true that you're going to take us to a concentration camp in Gaza? He was asking, is it true that you're going to relocate us, you're going to deport us to someplace else, someplace unfamiliar? But at this point, while there were rumors, it, it's unlikely that on July 20th, 1942, Chernyenko was asking about the truth of mass murder. That's not what he was asking. He was asking about, about deportation to another place, which one could say might have been desirable in order to ease the massive congestion of 400,000 people living in a fraction of the city. You're talking about 12, 15, maybe 20 people to a room. And in the congestion, the crowding, the crowding was, was almost unbearable. He asked that on July 20th, 1942. Beginning the next day, really July 22nd, but beginning July 21st, the great deportation began. And here we will now see a personal, intimate description by Abraham Lewin of exactly what that was. about the expulsion of Jews is spreading like lightning through the town. Jews run by in confusion, terrified. The Jewish streets are an appalling sight. The gloom is indescribable. On Zamanov Street, the Germans pulled people out of a tram and killed them on the spot. The roundup was halted at three o'clock. The savagery of the police during the roundup, the murderous brutality. They dragged girls from the rickshaws, empty out flats, 
and leave the property strewn everywhere. How did Jews hide? In couches, in beds, cellars, attics. Six Sona Street, 99 victims. Today, 12,000 murders. The violence of the police, the breakup of families. Mendrovsky Polo, it hurts so much. Only the workers in the workshops seem to still be safe. A meeting of Oinik Shabbos, its tragic character. They discuss the question of ownership and the transfer of the archive to America, to the YIVO, if we all die. It's a wonder that people can endure so much suffering, living the whole day on a knife edge between life and death, and clinging with all their might to life in the hope that they may be among the ten survivors. Early this morning, the Germans and the rioters spread through the ghetto, in the course of five minutes, and they drove out all the occupants on Gensha Street, between Zamanov and Lubyechka Streets. They pay no attention to papers. Eclipse of the sun. Universal blackness. My Luba was taken away. I have no words to describe my desolation. I ought to go after her, to die but I have no strength to take such a step. I will never be consoled as long as I live to fall into the hands of such pushers. How tragic it is, a life together of over 21 years has met such a tragic end. The side of the streets, the pavements are fenced off. You walk in the middle of the road, Certain streets are completely closed off with fences and gates, and you can't get in there. The impression is of cages. The whole of Jewish Warsaw has been thrown out of the buildings. There's a full-scale relocation of all Jews who have not yet been rounded up and are still in the town. The pain because of the loss of Luba is becoming more intense. My so I can find no peace for not having gone after her when she was in danger. Even though I could have also disappeared, and Aura would have been left an orphan. There's talk of a second front in France and Holland. If these things had happened four or five weeks ago, perhaps we would have been saved from the catastrophe. Six in the evening. Jewish policemen have returned from the town and said that the action is continuing. So, all our hopes that the bloody action has ceased now have been swept away. How will we survive? How will we be able to bear it? People talk of the special danger that now threatens children. A terrible dread seizes me when I think of the fate of Aura. She has no documents and is in danger. Since Friday, no news reaches us from the other side of the wall. The terrible appearance of the streets, transformed into an Umschlagplatz. The crowds of Jews with packs on their backs, streaming from the streets of the ghetto. Everyone who's camped out on the street. The Svecha family has perished. He gave himself up after seeing how his wife and two children were taken. Initially, he went with us to Geisha Street. Later, he went back, gave himself up, and was sent away. I feel a great compassion and admiration for this straightforward person. We tremble at every noise and shot that comes from the street. Today is the 52nd day in the greatest and most terrible slaughter in history. We are the tiny remnants of the greatest Jewish community in the world. A Jew has returned to our workshop who worked as a gravedigger in Treblinka. According to what he said, 
not only Jews from Warsaw and of the Gubernia are being exterminated in Treblinka, but Jews from all over Europe, from France, Belgium, Holland, among others. Those who are far away cannot imagine our bitter situation. They will not understand and will not believe that day after day, thousands of men, women, and children, innocent of any crime, were taken to their death. Almighty God, why did this happen? And why is the whole world deaf to our screams? How terrible it is that a whole generation, millions of Jews, has suddenly become a community of martyrs who have had to die in such a cruel, degrading, and painful manner and go through the torments of hell before going to the gallows. Earth, Earth, do not cover our blood and do not keep silent so that our blood will cry out until the ends of time and demand revenge for this crime that has no parallel in our history and in the whole of human history. was a game changer, if you will. It was the moment that the Jewish community in Warsaw had an epiphany. And the epiphany was that we can't believe or trust a word that the Germans say to us, their goal is not to relocate us. Their goal is not just to destroy us, but to destroy all Jews and every remnant of Judaism. And that was a shock for a people who had weathered persecution over thousands of years, who had survived and had celebrated survival, who had created strategies of wisdom that allowed themselves to be encouraged under the most difficult of circumstances. Now, all of a sudden, they saw that all those strategies were falling by the wayside and that, in fact, they were facing an enemy the likes of which they had never faced before and an enemy who had the wherewithal to do that which no one could have ever dreamed of doing before. So let's just quickly contextualize the dates. July 22nd to the 30th, approximately 65,000 Jews were taken for resettlement. Those with the proper papers, papers that said you were doing something that the Germans valued, they were exempt. If you showed them the paper on the street, the, the policemen and the soldiers were to walk by you. However, those 65,000 people were being resettled against the promises that were given to Cherniakov. Cherniakov understood what was going on, and three days after the diary entry that we read together, he committed suicide. July 31st to August 1st, 20,000 Jews volunteered for resettlement. Remember, at that time, there was still approximately 350,000 Jews in the ghetto. It was still, even after the 65,000 were taken out, it was massively crowded. People were starving to death on a daily basis, thousands of people. And 20,000 Jews volunteered for resettlement. They showed up on their own in exchange for bread and jam. Of course, they were taken to Treblinka and killed. We know now. They didn't know then, obviously. July 31st to August 14th, German and Lithuanian soldiers and Jewish police searched for and forcibly dragged off any Jew without papers. Now, it, it meant that they would go into buildings. It wasn't just if you were on the street. Any Jew that didn't have the proper papers that allowed him to be in Warsaw, working, et cetera, et cetera, was taken off. August 15th to the September 6th, anyone caught on the street could be taken, especially women and children. Papers were meaningless. 
when you pulled out of your pocket, here, I have permission to work, all of a sudden they were ripped up, they were thrown in, uh, in the garbage in front of you, and you were taken, especially women and children, because they were unable to work to begin with. September 6th to the 24th, an intensive section selection known as the Kessel, which is what he wrote about at the end, um, um, Lewin wrote about at the end, the cauldron, because they just grabbed anybody, it was brutal, it was terrible, it was the, the, the final great resettlement of that summer. In a space of 60 days, approximately 300,000 Jews were sent to their deaths in Treblinka. All that was left of the 40,000, 400,000 Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto were 60,000 Jews. But those 60,000 Jews were different than the Jews that existed before them. In that, they were, they were now dealing under a new awareness, a new understanding of the reality in which they found themselves. And that new understanding forced them to consider new types of action, actions that had not been seen, had, hadn't been seen in the Jewish people for millennium upon millennium. After the great transportation, let's hear from the people who survived it themselves. So when the people were going, being resettled, quote unquote, to the east. I once came home for lunch and found my parents beside themselves, uh, unrecognizable, really. And uh, my father said, we have something to tell you. Actually, we have to tell you two things, because your mother and I have different stories. So let your mother speak first. And my mother just said, took some box and says, Henry, these are poison pills. If you are caught by Germans, take them immediately. The message was, don't believe the Germans. If you can, you have to hide. If you can, you have to escape. You have to run you, 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 if you want to 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 try to, to to save your life because there is no life beyond Treblinka. At that meeting, we started doing the same what the Poles were doing, just telling that the, the, the traitors should be killed. And during that meeting, uh, during that meeting, it has been decided to kill Mr. Lakin. And Lakin was a head of the Jewish police at that time. After Sharinsky was taken by, uh, was almost assassinated and taken by the Germans. And Lakin was a small bastard, <laughs> you can imagine. And then we cornered him. We cornered Lakin. I mean, of course, I, I put my bullets into him, one or two bullets into him. Whether my bullets kill him or somebody else's bullets, I don't know. This is unheard of in the Jewish community, that parents would suggest to their children better to commit suicide than to trust the authorities, as brutal as the authorities might have been. The understanding that all the Mishnah in Avot tells us that you have to trust the government, because if you don't trust the government, people will beat each other's throats. Nevertheless, it was clearly understood that you can't trust a word the things, anything the Germans tell you. No matter what they tell you, you have to escape, you have to hide, but you cannot trust them. We settle nothing. A, a total breakdown of law and order. And lastly, you see that there was now the beginning of armed resurrection. In other words, we're going to fight back. And we have to see how that developed, how that concept, how the, 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 the lack of trust, how the shocking reality of their circumstance began to change the Jewish perspective of resistance. Perhaps we could say, and we can make the argument, that prior to this, resistance was always in a spiritual form. We refuse to relinquish our humanity. We refuse to relinquish our Judaism in whatever form that it took. We refuse to relinquish our 
desire to educate our children and to try to create a better life, no matter how humble that life might be. Now, all of a sudden, added to that type of resistance was the idea that there will be consequences for our enemies in ways that they understand. Death, perhaps. On January 18th, 1943, the deportations were to begin again. Over 1,000 German, Lithuanian, and Latvian soldiers and militiamen marched into the ghetto and demanded 8,000 Jews to assemble at the Umschlagplatz for deportation. Most Jews disappeared into hiding places. The German launched a massive search and snatched every Jew they could find for deportation. As the Germans were leading a line of captured Jews to the trains, a group of ZOB, youth group fighters that we'll see in a minute, opened fire on the Germans. For the first time in the history of the Warsaw Ghetto, the Germans encountered armed resistance. German forces retreated in confusion. Nevertheless, the action continued for four days. On January 21st, 21st the action ended. Approximately 5,000 Jews were captured. Some Germans and most of the Jewish fighters were killed. But the Germans experienced something they had never experienced before. No longer did Jews obey civil authority or military authority, but they fought back. And it sent the German, the German army, the German government, the Nazis, it sent them into absolute confusion. Now, what gave the Jews of course, the realization that their situation now was hopeless. The realization that everything and anything the Germans said was a lie. The realization that there could be no safe haven for the Jews if the Germans knew where they were or anything about them. But in addition to those very personal realities that now became obvious to the members of the ghetto, there was an awareness of what was going on outside the ghetto. There was an awareness of what was happening in the war. And one thing in particular impacted all decision making, I think, at that time. And that was at the end of February, the, the, the 2nd of January, 19, uh, 2nd of February, 1943, the Nazi Sixth Army in Stalingrad suffered a terrible defeat. Only 91,000 soldiers out of an army of almost a quarter of a million survived the battle. Stalingrad was the largest defeat ever experienced by the German army. And it was the defeat that shocked the Germans. They couldn't imagine how the Untermensch, the Russian, could launch such a, a tenacious fight. It was, they, they fought literally to the last person, literally, when there was nothing left, no city existed. The, the Russians staged a, a fierce, fierce, fierce resistance and the Germans buckled. There was a sense, as you heard from Lewin, that the war, there was a sense that things were changing. So now the question was not, should we fight back understanding that automatically we'll die? The question was, if we fight back, can we slow the process down so that we'll survive the war? From January 22nd until April 19th, 1943, deportations were halted from the Warsaw Ghetto. One can say, it's uh, Yisrael Gutman wrote, uh, uh, regarding this, regarding what happened after the war, one can say without exaggeration that the entire population from the young to the old was engaged in preparing hiding places. The ghetto looked like an army camp. In the courtyards, one could see Jews carrying sandbags, bricks, and lime. They worked day and night, especially industrious, were the bakers, because bread was purchased in great quantities for the prep preparation of rusks, a way to make the bread last uh, uh, is more than just bread. No one thought of willingly going to Treblinka. The survivors prepared everything necessary 
for remaining in hiding for months. No one wanted to die. No one wanted to go to Treblinka. Those who could fight would fight. Those who could hide would hide. But there was a sense of making an all-out attempt to survive the war and the defeat of the Germans by the Allied forces, as well as the fact that they saw when they resisted, the Nazis retreated. How did they prepare? They are already to uh, build bunkers underneath, because uh, I guess this was truly the end. And the deportations continued. And when we were on Bonifratesca, this was the first time that we heard about Treblinka. Because, you know, people like to uh, fool themselves. None of us, I mean, I, this goes for uh, my parents and everybody, we just couldn't believe that he did, that were herding us, transporting us to, uh, as they call, Vernichtungslag, you know, the uh, places where they are going to uh, gas us, you know, kill us off. The only chance to survive is to dig bunkers, dig, and camouflage in a way that no one can Okay, yeah, one, two, three opening. And that was a mass action to start building bunkers, people uh, out of a block of apartments, people of uh, some kind, uh, you know, each other, families. So they started all digging and preparing some hiding part of a, a, a floor or something, some room so no one could see. And, uh, of course, underground. Whoever had the possibility, the means, financial or otherwise had friends, uh, was trying to get to the Argent side. I had, didn't have that possibility. I didn't have any money and I didn't have any friends on the Argent side. And I was trying to get into the, the Jewish fighting organization where my friends that were working with me now, what were these fighting organizations? These were youth groups. These were kids. And you have to ask yourself, why youth groups? Well, first of all, youth are idealistic. Youth have inexhaustible hope. To a certain extent, young people believe they're invincible. And they combined with an idea that had been growing before the war, that even though there's anti-Semitism and the Jews have a right to have a place of their own, Zionism. All these things combine the, the reality of their circumstance, the, the information of that the Germans were failing on different fronts, the success in repelling the Germans, the dream that there can be a place where Jews have a right to live as Jews. All these things came together to create a courage that had lied, lied dormant in the Jewish people for thousands of years. On January 22nd, 1943, wrote ZOB Post, a Jewish fighting organization that's Mordechai and Levitz, who is a member of a Shomer Atzair. This is a mainstream Zionist organization. Perhaps, you know, if we have to use modern terminology, these would be like the Labor Party, right? These were, these were mainstream Zionists, not religious necessarily, mainstream Zionists. He wrote, January 22nd, 1943, six months will have elapsed since the start of the deportations from Warsaw. 300,000 of our brothers and sisters were transported to and brutally murdered in Treblinka death camp. We received reports left and right about Jews being killed. As we listen to these terrible tidings, we wait for our own time to come. Jewish masses, the hour is drawing near. You must be prepared to resist. Do not give yourself up like sheep to the slaughter. Our slogan must be, all are ready to die as human beings. The question now, he writes, is not 
come on, we think we can beat the Germans in their own war. I don't think he thought that. Now it was a question, since all is hopeless, what do we have? We only have our humanity. And we have to make sure that we preserve our humanity and by doing so, stage yet another fight against the Nazis. In essence, the desire and the willingness to pick up arms was, to a certain extent, in a certain way, another example of spiritual resistance. We will not allow the Nazis or anyone to deprive us of our humanity and our dignity and our right to be Jewish, if we so desire. Mark Edelman was from the Bund in Warsaw. He joined together with Anilevich to form the, the great resistance. When we, we then decided that a joint battle organization should be formed and that its purpose should be to prepare armed resistance for the time when the Germans might attempt to repeat the extermination procedure in the Warsaw Ghetto. We realized that only through coordinated work and our utmost joint efforts could any result at all be expected. If you have the opportunity to study in greater detail pre-war Europe, the Bund, who were a political party that was dedicated to staying in Poland and creating a secular Jewish culture, a Yiddish culture in Poland. They did not believe you should go to Israel. They fought tooth and nails with the Zionists. Nevertheless, when it came time, they said, we're now going to join forces in order to preserve human dignity, in order to preserve the remnant of the Jewish people, and in order to deprive the Nazis of the victory of the total destruction of the Jewish people will join forces. ZZW were the revisionists, the followers of Jabotinsky, right? And Trubeldor, right? Pavel Frankel, the head of the ZZW wrote, it was on a poster, we're going to war. Adopt the slogan, rise and fight. Do not despair of the chance for rescue. He who fights for his life has a chance of being saved. Find the courage to indulge in acts of madness. Put a stop to the degrading resignation expressed by such statements as, we are all bound to die. That's a lie. We too are deserving of life. You merely must know how to fight for it. Said, there can be miracles. So in this sense, he was, he was willing to take up arms in what seemed to be a hopeless battle. And lastly, if you will, to, to validate this idea that we shouldn't look at statistics when deciding to fight against the Germans. We had Rav Menachem Zemba. Rav Not, Rav Menachem Zemba was perhaps the greatest scholar of his day anywhere in the world. He was a Jewish leader of predominantly Orthodox Jewry in Eastern Europe but he was greatly respected amongst all elements of the Jewish community because he was a man of great integrity, even though he was what was called today ultra-Orthodox. He wrote, from the beginning, we should have used every opportunity and tactic to alert the conscience of the world. All we can do now is resist to the best of our abilities. We may not surrender ourselves voluntarily into enemy hands. What you see here in addition to the desire to act in a way that Jews had not acted for thousands of years, there was a uniting of the community. Practically all aspects of the Jewish community came together under the banner of resistance. And that in and of itself is a miracle of sorts. What exactly happened at the time of resistance. Then when the organization of the uprising started, my function was to go after curfew and paste the, uh, the posters calling uh, the Jews to armed rebellion on the walls of the buildings. 
uh, my father, of course, was uh, beside. He didn't know what I was doing, but when I was coming home after the curfew, it was uh, it was a terrible thing. They were terribly, terribly worried. What was that like? How could you maneuver yourself without being caught? You were streetwise. Uh, you know, there were patrols, but it was dark, and we knew the streets. And we're going through the valley, through the backyards. Uh, uh, you know, we're risking uh, our lives, but we were young, and uh, one was going with a bucket and uh, uh, and the brush uh, to paste the wall, and the other one was running with the roll of posters and uh, clipping them. You know, it was uh, uh, it was fun. You know, it was. Uh, we were too young, I think, to realize how dangerous it really was. It was a kind of a sport. What did it mean um, to you? Oh, I, uh, I was adamant that uh, I, uh, the order of the day from Hashem Eratzayir was that we are not going to be taken alive. You know, we are not going to be allowed to take on the transports. And I was all uh, uh, hyped up with it. I knew that this is exactly what I'm going to do. We are not going to go just like that. So uh, there was just a conviction. We are just not going. It was Passover when Things when the deportations began, when the Nazis marched into the ghetto, was Pesach, 1943. And we have a testimony from Shoshana Bahir. They had arranged everything in the house in preparation for the holiday. We even had matzot, unleavened bread, everything. We had made the beds. The policeman who lived with us always told us everything that was going to happen. He told us, you should know that the ghetto is surrounded with Ukrainians. Tonight will not be a good night. He had heard this. We took all our belongings and went into the bunker. Why wait? So we took what we still had at home, whatever food we had, everything, and we went down into the bunker and waited. Not only were they prepared to fight militarily, not only were they prepared to give their lives, but in the last moments before the onslaught, they were engaged in spiritual pursuits. They were engaged in pursuing spirituality, which is perhaps one of the greatest expressions of humanity, the ability to believe, to have culture, to have tradition. We write, Tuvia Borzikowski writes, amidst this destruction, the table in the center of the room looked incongruous with glasses filled with wine, with the family seated around, the rabbi reading the Haggadah, his reading was punctuated by explosions and the rattling of machine guns. The faces of the family around the table were lit by the red light from the burning buildings nearby. On April 19th, Arab Pesach, at four in the morning, German soldiers crossing the Naweki intersection on their way to the central ghetto, walking in an endless procession. Behind them were tanks, armored vehicles, light cannons, and hundreds of Waffen-SS units on motorcycles. They look, they look like they're going to war, I said to Tsipora, my companion at the post. Suddenly, I felt how very weak we were. What force did we have against an army, against tanks and armored vehicles? We had nothing but pistols and grenades. Simcha wrote him, right? And he died in 2018 in Yerushalayim. David Jakubowski. Now, after the 22nd, and <clears throat> we knew what's going on, where they go to Treblinka to death. So, buy, buy. But the Poles didn't want to sell us. The army, the Polish army. We paid for one revolver, three to five thousand dollars. For one bullet, ten dollars. Now, during the main or so-called resettlement, there was a very complicated political situation in the Warsaw Ghetto, because there were so many parties, and the, 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 the Zionist right and left and revisionist, they couldn't get together. 
But on the 28th, they formed, they somehow, they came together and they formed 22 groups. They called, one was called GOB, the Jewish Fighting Organization, and the other one was called Irgun Zweile Umi. This was the revisionists, which were the followers of Jabotinsky and Trumperdor. So what was the main thing now? Buy arms. Because they were, the ZOB had 700 people and Tzvai Leumi had 300. But could they have thousands of the young people? But there were no arms. The Polish government in London at that time sent us 50 revolvers with munition, 50 hand grenades, and four kilograms of explosive. We bought 4,000 on the Aryan side for money, 4,000 liters of gasoline. So when the tanks attack it, we'll burn it. Now, we trained the youngsters. As I said, we were preparing ourselves to fight. So the <clears throat> underground, the 700s and the 300, they were trained. But what? We didn't have any guns, any, um, what do you call it, these guns, uh, so rifles. with sticks. Eh? With some bayonets and rifles. Rifles. We didn't have rifles, so they trained with sticks. So <clears throat> there was a bunker. In every building there was a bunker where people had to hit in case of a new action and there was a physician assigned to every bunker. I was, I had 70 or 80 people in the bunker, <clears throat> assigned to my bunker from my building. And, oh, unforgettable, the first night of Pesach, the first Seder. But before I tell you about this, we had spies, Jewish spies on the Aryan side, and the German knew that they won't get us out so simple. They left to fight. And they told us how they prepared the German, what they had against us. is 2,000 SS soldiers. Listen to this. Three detachments of artillery. 1,000 of German police. 1,000 of Polish police. And 1,000 of Ukrainians, Lithuanians, Latvians, and Estonians in the black uniforms the supporting police. Against them, we were 700 in the Jewish fighting organization and 300 in the other organization. But the Germans knew it would come, won't come easy. And on the first Seder, on April 19th, 1943, we get a note calls from the other side, the Germans are surrounding the ghetto. So, Immediately, everybody went to the bunkers and me, I had some medicine. What medicine did I have? Aspirin and nothing else. But, and some material, you know, for wounds. And all the soldiers went to their posts. And on the 19th in the morning, I show you on the, my drawing there, through the Muranoska gate, Next to the Umstrapplatz, a platoon of German soldiers came through the Muranoska street into the ghetto and went to the Muranoska square, singing, you know, the northern people, the Obermenschen, Supermenschen, singing, happy. Now, when they came on the Muranoska street, there were two buildings there with flags. One Jewish flag with the Magandavid, and one Polish flag. The boys, the Jewish boys knew that every bullet has to kill. Otherwise, they won't come out. So when they stopped singing and standing there on the Moranaska Square, they came under fire. And it was hell for them because so many fell. They threw their guns and they ran away. Now, every piece of arms, every revolver, every gun, every submachine guns were collected. 
That's how the, <clears throat> how the underground got submachine guns. There was not one, one was only in the whole ghetto. And uniforms, everything was collected. Two tanks went on Muranoska Street, on Zamenhofer Street, also from Muranoska Gate, on Zamenhofer Street, I'll show it to you, to Mila 8. And there they were waiting for them, two tanks. They threw the Molotov cocktails on them and burned two tanks. So the Germans left. They were scared. They left the ghetto and they knew they can't fight just on the open streets. <coughs> so they sent planes and the planes started to bomb us. Mordechai Alevich wrote, it's impossible to put into words what we've been through. One thing is clear. What happened exceeded our boldest dreams. The Germans ran twice from the ghetto. One of our companies held out for 40 minutes and another for more than six hours. Several of our companies attacked the dispersing Germans. Our losses in manpower are minimal. That is also an achievement. I feel that great things are happening. And what we dare do is of great, enormous importance. What we need urgently, grenades, rifles, machine guns, and explosives. It is impossible to describe the conditions under which the Jews of the ghetto are now living. Only a few will be able to hold out. The remainder will die sooner or later. Their fate is decided. The fact that we are remembered beyond the ghetto walls encourages us in our struggle. Peace go with you, my friend. Perhaps we may still meet again the dream of my life has risen to become fact. Self-defense in the ghetto will have been a reality. Jewish armed resistance and revenge are facts. I have been a witness to the magnificent heroic fighting of Jewish men in battle. This is the fortification of the sense of humanity, the sense of Judaism, and interestingly enough, we, we've just finished the book of Bamidbar, of Numbers, and in it we read about Pinchas, uh, and he writes, he killed the prince of Israel who, who desecrated God's name with uh, one of the harlots of, of um, Midian, and he also was given the blessing of peace. And it's interesting that Anna Levitch writes, peace go with you, my friend. Now that we're fighting, we have the opportunity to, to create a peace, a lasting peace, a peace that exists for humans. Benjamin was a member of the Bund. Benjamin Mead. And I was walking on the streets and uh, the whole city was in flame because the whole city was burning. So many blocks, not one, so many blocks. And I looked at these blocks, but the worst thing for me was the Eastern Sunday. When I was in the church, listening to all the sermons of the, of the priest, and I blend in with them together and I came out, the priest was standing in the front, greeting all the parishioners, and they were dressed in their best clothing on Sunday. Most of them took their children to their, to their carousel, which was with music, which was around that. You could see with the naked eye what was going on in the ghetto the flames and the burning, everything. And you were just listening to the expressions, Jews are burning, not burning. Jews are Zitkishes Majo, Jews are frying. I was in that environment of the people. Until today, I cannot understand where did I take the strength not to scream? not to reveal who I am, that I look at my people burning and I cannot say anything.
and here the carousel is dry, is running. The people are on the carousel with the parents happy. When the Germans destroyed the great synagogue on Klomaki Street, that already marked the beginning of the end of the rebellion. The rebellion itself lasted for quite, there were always pockets for, for, for quite a while. Uh, the exact date that there were no pockets, I, I, I don't know. It was really almost for the rest of the war. And uh, it, 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 the, the end is marked when uh, Jürgen Strupp, who was the general who conducted the final liquidation of the ghetto, the Jewish quarter in Warsaw no longer exists on May 16th, 1945. That was part of a report he made to Heinrich Himmler. And while the physical ghetto was destroyed, there were people who hid. There were people who survived the war in hiding. But more important is there existed a new sense that Jewish life was not worthless and that Jews were people too. Jewish lives mattered. Yitzhak Zuckerman, who was a fighter, survived the war. He came to Israel and he was one of the, those who established the Kibbutz Lochmei HaGetot in northern Israel. And he writes, I don't think there's any real need to analyze the uprising in military terms. This was a war of less than a thousand people against a mighty army and no one doubted how it was likely to turn out. This isn't a subject for study in military school, not the weapons, not the operations, not the tactics. If there's a school though, to study the human spirit, there it should be a major subject. The really important things were inherent in the force shown by Jewish youth after years of degradation to rise up against their destroyers and determine what death what death would choose, what they would choose, Treblinka or uprising. I don't know if there's a standard to measure that, that bravery. The Warsaw Ghetto is, if you will, the parent of what we are today. We're the Jewish people, and we are a people who has our own country. We have an army to defend us. We have a place where we can develop as Jews and we have a sense of humanity that no one has the right to take away. And that's our discussion today of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. If you have any questions now, uh, I'd be more than happy to try to answer them. I apologize again. We started about half hour late. Um, if you have any questions, I'll do my best. Rabbi, there's one question in the chat. Do you think the start of deportation was hastened by the questions to the German governors the day before? You mean by Cherniakov? No. No. When they lied and they said that they had no knowledge of any deportations, that was an out-and-out -out lie because these were planned well in advance. Remember, they built the entire Treblinka death camp in order to dispose primarily of the Jews of Warsaw. So this was well planned. Anybody else? Ellen, go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, my question is, do you think that the outside world knew what was happening and if so, why didn't they do, say anything or do anything? All right, so they did know to a, an extent what was happening. They knew because there were people, Polish people who escaped and told them about it. But there was a, a sort of a general uh, opinion that was pervasive, certainly in America, Roosevelt and in England, Churchill, that they did not want, there was a lot of anti-Semitism, and they didn't want the war to become a, a fight for the Jews. They wanted to destroy the Nazi machine, and everyone would benefit. A. B. While they knew what was going on, they didn't know what was going on. In other words, no one could imagine that 
millions of people were being disposed of. Like, like taking the trash out to the incinerator. It was incomprehensible. And they knew, they had an idea of what was going on. They had an idea that the Jewish people were suffering great decimation, that the Nazis were making war, but they didn't fully understand. And thirdly, most scholars today, historians today, seem to agree with the idea that the Allies were unwilling to participate in the destruction of the Jewish people in order to curtail what they weren't sure of um, that the Germans were doing. So they could have done more. They should have done more. The Jewish people suffered because they didn't. But by the time they did understand what was going on, perhaps the most, the wisest course of action was to win the war. Okay. What do you say, Susan? I think if there are no more questions, thank you very much. Shelly, would you like to um, say a few words before we go? Okay, yes. Rabbi Moshe, thank you so much. This has been the most remarkable experience, utterly unforgettable, and you have taken us into history that it would have been impossible really to see through very different eyes. And it, it just is such a, uh, such a testament to your, to your ability to be able to do that with us. And thank you, thank you for doing Thank you very much for your kind words. I, I'm looking forward to being again with you for anti-Semitism, yes. which is a completely different type of uh, presentation, same format, but a different thing. And you guys were great. Thank you for including me in this uh, important uh, learning program that you have as part of your temple. It, it was a great honor for me to be part of it. And um, I look forward to seeing you again. Yes. Everyone should stay safe. Stay safe. Stay healthy. You as well. Thank, Thank you, you, Rabbi. Bye. Susan, did you want to add something? Before we go? Yeah. I'll just add, I hope to see you all at our outdoor service Friday evening. I think that's our next to look forward to. So Rabbi Cohn, we wish you could come too, but you know, we understand. Some in the future, hopefully. Exactly. All right, take care of yourselves. You as well. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Unless you want to stay. No, I don't.